a note about our scripture this morning. We are reading out of Exodus while you get to Exodus chapter 2 in your Bible. It's at the very beginning of it if you're hunting. Exodus chapter 2. I know in the bulletin it says 3. We're going to back up a couple of verses. We're going to start at 2.23. But I will mention that this scripture is the lectionary text this morning. And this is the last week that we're using the lectionary text exclusively for a while. Um, starting next week, we'll go into a series um, called Happy People, where we'll look at some biblical characteristics of joy and happiness. Um, so that is to come, but now we relish in our last lectionary text for a while, Exodus chapter 3, but we're going to start at chapter 2 and back up a little bit. Um, before we actually start reading, I will note, as I am fond to say, you can't understand the text without the context. So we're going to back up a smidge in our story. We're going to note that Exodus chapter 3, we, we see a couple of characters, what's happening. In Genesis, we're introduced to this God who does these incredible things and makes this deal, this, this um, covenant with Abraham. And God says, Abraham, your descendants will be my people and I will be their God. They will get this land, they will prosper, it will be incredible. Um, God does these miraculous things, interacts with Abraham and his descendants. And at the end of Genesis, all these descendants end up in Egypt. All right, that's where our story ends in Genesis. Exodus picks up right there, and it says that a while goes past, and during that time, the people forget about Joseph. They forget about Abraham. Specific and it, got to kick that in. Sorry, Joseph. Um, Abraham's specific descendants, and they they eventually come to the point where they start um, enslaving the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham. They enslave them. They make them work for free. They treat them miserably. And so the people are found in this period of bondage. They're in this period um, of suffering, and they still know God. We hear about these midwives who save some babies because they're afraid of God. They still know God, uh, but God is kind of absent from the scene. During that time, we meet this guy named Moses who grows up in Pharaoh's house, even though he is Jewish. Eventually, he kills somebody and runs away. He's now living in the wilderness. He's doing pretty good for himself. He's hanging out with his father-in-law. He's married. He's, um, he's, it seems like, living a good middle-class American dream life, hanging out. That is where our story picks up. All right, that's the context, a little bit to know what's happening. And we're going to start reading Exodus 2, 23. We're going to start just a little bit before 3. And it happened, when a long time had passed, the king of Egypt died, and the Israelites groaned from the bondage and cried out, and their plea from bondage went up to God. So the whole people are in this state of suffering, and they cry out to God, this God of their ancestors, they cry out. And it says, and God heard their moaning. The first time that God is an active character in the story, God heard their mourning. Moaning, God remembered God's covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites, and God knew. God knew. There's no, there's no object there. God knew. This, this beginning to chapter 3 introduces what is about to become the main character of this entire book. He, God already was the main character of the entire book. We just didn't see it happening. In Walks God, it's this scene... Um, it's like, to understand this story, you have to understand who God is. And when I read this scene, it's like in those like action movies or like it's like in like professional wrestling when there's this tension happening and then you get introduced to this like wise character that you thought was in retirement, like the, like the Undertaker's hanging out off stage. Um, and it's like, then the Undertaker heard what was going on and like raises up and says, hmm interesting right it's like it's building this suspenseful moment and you're saying who is the undertaker who is this person that's coming later on we're going to see some more action movie instances later on um, in our scripture god's going to describe god's self as i am that which i am it's like a really great wrestling line like right before they like body slam the person like i am sent you Ooh. um but god is setting up who god is god is building god's character and it's important for us to remember that that as far as we know, Moses has never had an encounter with God. As fact, as far as we know, the people of Israel had never had a direct encounter with God, the ones that are alive now. It's been a long period while they've been in Egypt in bondage. And so they're crying out to this deity that they've been told about for generation after generation. 
not knowing if this deity is going to hear or not. And then the deity hears. It says God sees, God hears, God knows. We don't know what God knows, um, and I think there's an important lesson in that. We don't know what God knows. If someone tells you they know the mind of God, then they are delusional. We don't know what God knows. My guess is God knows the suffering. God relates to the people. God knows that God must act. God knows what God is going to do. And so then we pick up in chapter 3 with God doing. And Moses was herding a flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, priest of Midian. And he drove the flock into the wilderness and came to the mountain of God to Horeb. A note, this is just a a Bible note. In chapter 2, we know the father-in-law is not called Jethro. He's called Ruib, Rule. We know that later on Horeb is going to be Sinai. We know, all right? We'll talk about that after church. Um, And the Lord's messenger appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And Moses saw, and look, the the bush was burning with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses thought, let me pray, turn aside, that I may see this great sight, why this bush does not burn up. And the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to see, and God called from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And God said, come no closer. Take off your shoes for your, from your feet, for the place you are standing is holy ground. I asked if I could preach barefoot, and Cecilia said no. Um, and he said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And God said, indeed, I have seen the abuse of my people that are in Egypt. And I've heard their outcry because of their taskmasters. I have heard for I know pain. And I have come down to rescue from the hands of Egypt and to bring the people from the land to a goodly and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now look, the outcry of the Israelites has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. So now, go, that I may send you to Pharaoh, And bring my people to Israel out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring out the Israelites from Egypt? And God said, For I will be with you. This is the sign, for I myself have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Look, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, they'll say, well, then what's his name? What am I supposed to tell him? And God said to Moses, I am, or I will be, who I am has sent you. Thus shall you say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And God said further to Moses, Thus shall you say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am invoked in all ages. You get the buildup, the suspense of this action movie that's about to play out in front of us. The heavyweights just entered the ring. The tone has changed. Things have gotten intense. Get me my popcorn. Moses and God are having this interaction. And again, to start this story, we have to understand who this God is. God reminds us and reminds the people, I'm the God of Genesis. I'm the God of your fathers. You know me. You've heard the stories about me. And Moses says, yeah, I've heard the stories, but who are you? And God says, that's right. You want to know who I am? The, the trick with the I am that which I am, I shall be that which I shall be, is is basically what's happening there is, is it's like with other names in the Hebrew Bible, it would be like um, the, the construct is like he who laughs, he who builds, he who redeems. Um, that's the pattern. God in this is saying, I am, period. You can't come up with an adjective for God. God is not one simple thing. Every name that you have ever heard, I am all of those things. I am the absolute. As Charlie said this morning, God is saying, I am the 
constant, the one constant thing in the entire history of the world that everyone can depend on, God says, I am. And you can't put that into feeble words. We cannot know the mind of God. We also can't even imagine how incredible that God is. God is reintroducing God's self to the people and saying, I am everything. You're worried about creation. I am the one who created it. You're worried about what's going to happen in the future. I am the God that transcends time. You're worried about the Egyptians. I'm the God who created and control and have power and dominion over the Egyptians. God is saying, I am. So we have this character, God. And so that's why it's such a big deal that God comes and says, I have heard, I have seen, I know. That God, that God says, I hear the people's cry. You might be enslaved, you might be the lowest of the low right now, but I hear you. I'm on your side, I'm going to do something about it. The curious thing, the frustrating thing is what God, that God, the almighty God, chooses to do about it is not really light a bush on fire and send a dude. Like, it's a weird, it is a weird response when you build up God that much, and then God says, okay, so Moses, you're in. It's a weird thing. But that is how God seems to work in the world. I don't know why God does it, but God regularly seems to use creation, use us to do God's will in the world. God says, I have heard and I care. I am concerned. I know. Let me call my bud Moses. And so God drafts Moses into this thing um, and sends Moses on his way. The God who sees, the God who hears, the God who knows becomes the God who sends. The God who calls us and sends us so that God's will might be done. We we have this scene between this powerful uh, action hero, wrestler, incredible figure, and then just this kind of normal guy. And I love that. I love that that's how that happens because this line, this is my name forever and thus I am invoked in all ages, it reminds us we're in the all ages. This stuff is still happening today. This God who's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is also the God of your great grandma and grandpa and brother. Um, And and it's, it's our God. This is the same God. I am that which I am is God to us. And just like back in the day on the, the, in the wilderness, God is out here still calling us to do things that God needs done. It's wild. It blows me away. And it's interesting because of that to consider Moses' response in this story. Um, Moses, is, Moses is wandering in. He's in the wilderness. Um, Already we know that Moses is not expecting a God encounter. There's some audaciousness here. The wilderness, we have heard this before, the wilderness is a chaotic place. People didn't like going to the wilderness. They didn't think God was in the wilderness. Um, We still believe that today because, like, there's no water in Starbucks there. But, like, back then they thought there were, like, these gods of chaos there. Primarily they thought it was because there were ostriches in the wilderness, which, like, if you don't, if you haven't seen an ostrich lately, Brian's got a video of an ostrich right? Like, we can kind of get it, right? Like, we understand why they didn't want to be there. Ostriches are chaos, and so this, that's the, the wilderness. God's not there, surely. So Moses is already in this uncomfortable place, already has his guard up, and maybe that's why he notices this thing. Not expecting to encounter God, Moses notices something curious off in the distance, We know that Moses doesn't instantly know what it is because he goes up with a curious apprehension rather than like a holy reverence. Um, He just sees this bush off in the distance. And so he goes up and he engages with the bush fire, figures out that it's God, takes off his shoes. I'm a big proponent of not wearing your shoes. And so I just want to repeat that over and over again. Takes off his shoes because he's on holy ground. Um, And eventually, after some haggling with God, ultimately does God's will. There's some important things to note about Moses in this story. And first is that Moses is at least a little bit observant. At least a little bit observant. Right? Moses could have just kept walking in the desert, not even noticed anything, kept his eyes on his goats. Um, Moses could have seen something in the distance and said, oh, that's none of my concern. I'm going to keep going. Moses is at least a little bit observant and at least a little bit curious. Sometimes we find ourselves saying, oh, where's God in the world? Surely God's not calling me to do something. Surely um, I don't know what my place is. 
maybe we just need to look up. Maybe we just need to look around a little bit. Maybe we just need to observe the world around us. Maybe, maybe we're missing the burning bushes. Sometimes whenever I read this story, I wonder if Moses was the first person that God tried to reach. Like, I wonder if this bush had been burning for like two weeks and people just kept walking past it. And so finally, Moses is the one that pulls off. I don't know. I don't know if it was specifically Moses or not, but I'm curious about that, that this idea that, that sometimes maybe Maybe God's just waiting for us to notice something. We open up our eyes. We, we look up a little bit. We stop being so distracted by ourselves and our current occupations and our current preoccupations. Um, and we stop scrolling and we stop whatever and we just observe. Moses is a little bit observant. I also noticed that Moses is a little bit humble. I'm going to give him a fair reading. He is a little bit humble. He's like, God, why are you sending me, God, I'm not good enough. Sometimes we get really confident God is sending me because I'm really special. Moses is not that. He's like, God, I don't even lift. I don't know why you're sending me to fight Pharaoh. What is happening right now? And God reminds Moses, it's not about you. It's about me. We need to walk with a spirit of humility, remembering it's not about us. It's about the God who is with us. Moses says, no, 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 no. The point, God says, no, the point isn't for Moses to go deliver the people. It's for God to deliver the people. Maybe, maybe God was waiting for someone to notice the bush. Maybe God was waiting for someone who wasn't all that spectacular to notice the bush. Because if they were too good, people would get confused and think that person was God. Maybe, maybe God needs someone who's a little bit not quite as confident, who doesn't quite know the words to say, who isn't quite sure of themselves. Maybe that's the perfect person so that ultimately God might be glorified. Maybe. God, God reminds Moses, I am with you. I will be with you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what skills you have. Your credibility is not the thing that matters. Mine is. Again, back to this, this wrestling idea where they're sh showing off in the ring and it's like I'm standing against somebody else and then John Cena is the one on the rope behind me. People aren't scared of me. They're scared of John Cena. God I'm not going to say God is John Cena. That's blasphemous. Um, but nonetheless, that is the power behind us is God is there with us. And so he sends Moses off to do this thing. Another thing that happens sometimes, Moses is curious. Moses, Moses observes. But also Moses demonstrates this care for the other. You see, this isn't Moses' problem anymore. Moses has gotten out of Egypt. Moses is on his own. He's doing his own thing. He's got his small business. He diversified and started selling goat poop as, man as manure the other day. Like, it's a whole thing. Moses is good. His life is set. He's happy. This isn't his problem. That's not what he says to God. He says, okay, I'll go. Sometimes we need to remember that, that Maybe to address the problems of the world, God doesn't call on the people experiencing the problems. He calls on other people to come in and help. God sent Moses into the place of captivity. Sometimes our problem is, is we notice God. We hear God. We say, yes, God, you're with me. But then we say, but that's not my problem. That's not a me thing, God. Like, God, I got my own stuff to figure out. I've got my own things to worry about. Maybe... People are waiting, desperately waiting for God to answer their prayers, and it's not happening because we're on the sidelines saying, that's not about me. Waiting. Um, all of this story, this all reminds me of um, a story, I think I've told you this before, so sorry, but it reminds me of a time uh, several years ago, 2013, because I went back and looked up some pictures, um, in 2013, there was this chemical explosion in this town called West Texas, not the area West Texas, West comma Texas. Um, there was this chemical explosion and it kind of wrecked the whole town. And so at the time, I took a group of high schoolers. We loaded up a couple of vans. I took some high schoolers to go like volunteer down there. Uh, we were at a Methodist church, but we went with the Texas men, um, Texas Baptist men. Shout out to Texas Baptist men. We went down there, and we were just going to help out, right? But remember, I had a bunch of high schoolers. And also at the time, I'm 23 years old, so I'm like basically a high schooler, right? And so we roll down there. Everything's exciting. The first day, we get there. We show up. They tell us the house we're going to go to. We show up at this house. Um, it's a lady who lives by herself. And what had happened is the explosion had happened, and her house looked totally normal. It had shifted her house eight inches over. So it like 
pushed it off of the foundation by eight inches. House looks totally normal, clearly the house is condemned now because it's literally off the foundation. So our job that day, we were not supposed to tear down the house, much to the chagrin of the high schoolers. Our job was to prepare for the demolition of the house. So we had to come in, we had to pull a fence out of the ground. So we had to like knock like concrete pillars out. You know, we had to clean up the debris so that the wreckers and all the crews could actually get into this house, all right? So it's me, a bunch of high schoolers, it's the first day of a mission trip. We understand that there's tra tragedy and devastation, but like also we're just kind of having a good time. Um, we're having fun with it. We're making up songs. At one point, we find this like really creepy doll. This is what I found a picture of. I went back and found, you see that creepy doll? Um, we found that doll just like in the ground. And so obviously the high schoolers adopted it. They named it Susie. Um, and so all day long, like, they would, like, prank each other by, like, hiding it behind something. Um, and so then a kid would, like, like, pull up a potion, there's Susie, and they're like, oh, my gosh. Like, they were just having so much fun, right? It was a great time. We did a lot of good work. Um, we actually have another picture. Just to emphasize the vibe, at one point, Susie's arm fell off. And so the next day, uh, my bud Bailey was just wandering around with a little tidy dollar. Like, that, that was the vibe. I need you to understand that was the vibe just so that you don't think we're that incredible, okay? That was the vibe. So a couple days go past. We're working out every day we're at a different house. So I have not seen these people again. Um, a couple of days go past, and I get a call from, like, our office, our church office, so like, from my employers. Um, and they say, hey, William, we just got a letter addressed to the youth of our church, um, and it's from an address in West Coma, Texas, so, like, where you are right now. Do you want us to open it? And I was like, yeah, I'm very curious what this is. Go ahead and open it. And so they open the letter, and they say it's from, and they tell me the name, and I recognize it's, it's that lady's name, like the first house, that lady's name. Um, and I instantly think, oh, no, what's in this letter? Like, what, what is she about to tell us? Like, I am so offended that you spent the day traipsing around with a doll in the face of me losing my house. Like, I was terrified what this letter was going to say. And so the lady, she starts, and she starts by saying, like, we've experienced this tragedy. I've lost everything that I own. It's been so hard these last couple of months. She said, I've just been praying for God to show up and answer my prayers. I haven't known what to do, and I'm just waiting for the shoe to drop. And then you came along, and you jerks were so insensitive. But the next line says, and on Monday morning, 12 angels got out of a van and answered God's prayer. This lady had seen these high schoolers doing work all day, and she went on to say, your joy was infectious, and I was happy for the first time in months. She went on to say, like, like, I was starting to doubt that God was able to hear my prayers, but now I know that God loves me and cares about me. This letter, it was this testament to, to these high schoolers who showed up, played with a doll, sledgehammered some stuff, and went home that they were answering someone's prayer. That's not why we went. We went to have fun demolishing some things. We went because we're supposed to care about people, blah, blah, blah. But like to this lady, this was the presence of God in the form of high schoolers wandering around with doll arms pretending to be their own. The presence of God, this is what's happening in this story is God is calling Moses and says, it doesn't matter who you are. My people are crying out, and so I'm sending you to be my presence to answer these prayers. And the beautiful thing is God is still crying out. God is still calling us to be the answer to people's prayers. And we do it in big ways. We do it by going on mission trips. We do it by showing up in significant ways. But we also do it in really small ways. We do it by just reflecting God in our lives. We do it by showing people what the love of God looks like, even when they don't deserve it. We do it by showing up at work and saying, how am I glorifying God today? We do it by changing the way we act. It's, this is essentially our Wednesday night study. How, what are the values that guide you and how can that affect your everyday decisions and lives? God is calling us to be the very presence of God. God promised Abraham. And God says, to fulfill this promise, I'm going to need you, Moses. And that is still going on. That promise that God gave Abraham is still active today. We think eventually that this guy named Jesus came along and fulfilled that promise, but we're still part of God fulfilling that promise and being the presence of God in the world. And so I implore you, I don't know whether it's going to be a burning bush. I don't know whether it's going to be a nudge. I don't know whether it's just the quiet confidence of knowing that you, in fact, are a representative of God in the world, but I implore you, please take this call seriously. Take a moment to observe the world around you. Take a moment to humble yourself and say, God is with me. 
Take a moment to be attuned to where God might be sending you. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to mess up. It's going to be chaotic. But God is sending you. God is saying, hey, and you are saying, here I am. That is our call. Pray with me. God, thank you for being the God of burning bushes. God, thank you for being the God that hears, that sees, that cares, that knows. God, we pray that you might make your call upon us obvious. That it might be something that catches our eyes so that we might know what you would have us to do. God, we pray for your will to be done and for your kingdom to come. Amen.